Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are director Jeffrey Smith and our artist actor Haraj Tatizian. Filmmaker, director, producer Jeffrey Smith was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. He earned a bachelor's of education from Monash University in his hometown. Jeffrey's made 23 documentaries, going on 25, 30, 40, whatever, uh, films, and he now lives in London. Uh, was Monash a film school? It, it had an interesting, a really interesting film department um, run by a couple of crazy guys that used to lock us in rooms and just sort of make us watch films all day long. Oh, that was a film department? And, and that was <laughs> the best thing for us, really. I mean, you need to have a, an education. It's like French or German. You need to sort of get to grips with the grammar of filmmaking. And it is then, Actually, it is, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then they'd let us go out with the camera, and that's really the best film school you can imagine, I think. So you weren't really there uh, as a film student. Did you Oh, no, I was there film? as a film student. I was not there as a teacher, though. But, um, but it was a teaching. <laughs> did you think teaching, you would teach but, film? Never. No, 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 no. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to make films, and that was the best place to be. Is that? Oh, that was. Yeah. Then, then what was your first film? How did you get started? I worked in the Australian feature industry a bit, but I was, I was a, like a junior art director. I was an assistant editor. I was an assistant cameraman. Well, stuff, that's right? learning too, isn't it? But what I learned about fiction films is that uh, it was a whole, you know, I didn't like it actually. I didn't like it. And I thought I could make my own things, um, which you could never do in a fiction film without a whole lot of money and experience. So documentaries was much more my bag because it was real. But uh, that's so. funny because at one point, maybe at the point when you started making films, documentaries were more um, exciting because there was this long period that documentaries were like cross, do not go near them, right? Yeah. And to be honest, I don't like using the word documentary. I think it's a kiss of death. I think the public still think of them as low production values, boring, a right. medi medicine that's supposed to be good for you but doesn't taste nice, and all these issue films and all this stuff that, frankly, uh, many of them are. Um, but get away from the word. Just call it a film, call it a real-life drama. I mean, in my case, there's a hell of a lot of emotion in this film. And well, you started with a film that has a lot of emotion. Yeah. You were on a search for a killer. Tell us about how you really got started in the, I, on your own. Yeah, I mean, the BBC had this wonderful program slot, um, Video Diaries, which was just they give you a camera, a little bit of money, but the whole point was that you were going to do this experience. It's not a set-up job. It was literally, this is a real-life experience. And I'd got shot. Um, in a very sort of difficult set of circumstances in Haiti. In Shot, I mean, with a gun. Literally with an M16, you know. Yeah. Lots of people killed just before I was shot. Um, I was very lucky to be alive. Oh. Um, and I never got over it in London. And I said to myself, I just have to go back to Haiti to find the man who shot me. That was my, my way of thinking that I was going to get better. It was a white, Western, rational... Um, rather silly approach. And so this was but that, that was documentary the premise kind of for the film. For and the they, film, right? They threw a camera at me, the BBC, and said, "You're off." And I discovered, en route, that the the camera is this wonderfully cathartic uh, device for myself. You know, I, I I got better by talking things through and experiencing my journey on the camera, through the camera, and. While looking for this. It was while looking for this guy. And I got better through a Haitian method of dealing with my trauma rather than a, a Western one. And what is that? I never found the guy, but it didn't matter in the end. I just found out that I could heal myself by being there um, and coming to grips with it in the way that they would come to grips with it. Much, much more interesting and much more satisfying. So that was your first foray into this. Then how did you find, to make 23, 24, 24, 30, whatever, documentaries. How do you find your subject matter? Um, I, I suppose I'm drawn, because of the experience that I had happened to me, I'm drawn to the fact that 
people in crisis, people in real life, life and death situations, uh, need someone to, to talk to, need someone to listen to them. And I have this, uh, I love listening to people and it seems as if people like talking to me. So uh, many of those things were, were medical to begin with because there's, there's an abundance of medical stories. Um, and but this, this is still, this is in essence a medical narrative, this new one. But it's the the not English really surgeon is what we're talking about as far as being medical. Yeah. But, but as far as um, finding or listening to people, that doesn't actually give you a, a idea for what to do, or well, it doesn't give you a subject matter. No, but the, the med a medical narrative does. If there's a problem with somebody medically, there's a process to try and fix them, uh -huh. there's suspense, and then there's a resolution, good or bad. So you have an inbuilt narrative in a, in a medical situation. So were most, of these, were most of these medical? No, not, not at all. I just said that at the beginning we made a series and yeah. then I, oh, I ended you did. up making another series later on about, about life and death oh, too, oh, I mean, oh. about a hospice. I but see. I've done lots of crime things as well. That's which, what I thought, again, because what I was going to ask you is um, most of the things you've done the majority were for the BBC. That's right. And so did they give you the assignments or did you come with It was what you both. We, we would occasionally have ideas of our own um, which, which follow through or we would be, you know, talk about things in the house and then one would go and make them. It was a very rich and fertile place to be, a very nice place to be for a while. So as far as like a, a big feature film documentary, those were on the, the telly. These, the English surgeon, is on the big screen, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. plays like a major film. That's right, yeah, that's right. The color is fantastic. I just love the way it looks on the screen. It's beautiful. And so, so tell us about it before I go well, on and on. I shot, cut, scored, How did you... directed it, structured it, conceived <laughs> of it as a drama. It's, it's a total uh, this drama. Is... This is, you know, the, the life and death. <laughs> um, stuff that goes on in this man's life. It's, this is Dr. High drama. Dr. Dr. Henry, Henry Marsh. Marsh. How yeah. did you meet him? Through the BBC. Uh, um, I, see. I was okay. asked to do a, a, a series about surgeons. I met him. I see. And this was the second film I made with him. We made another one oh. um, back five years ago, which was very successful. Six million viewers watched it on BBC One in, in London. But this must um, have been easier because he could just pretend you were in the background. He didn't have that feeling no, about I mean, your that, being the, there. No, I mean, what you're watching with a film like this is you're ending, with any real documentary, you're watching the, the, the director's relationship with the subject. And if that's a good relationship and it's a trusting one, as it is with Henry and myself, he takes you, the audience, into a place where you feel safe, even though it's a very intimate, voyeuristic, maybe sensitive place. Yeah. But it's all right because he trusts me and I certainly trust him. So how long did it take you to make this? Because it's a long period of time. Uh, he, he gave me some archive footage from ah, 10 years ago. I but see. believe it or not, my actual shooting period, like a feature film, was, was a very intense three weeks. That's all? That's all we did it with. And then um, you said you edited it and put the music in. Where'd you get the music? Music, once again, very special. I had a connection really? with Nick Kay from Melbourne, who's a famous uh, musician. He used to be a very heavily punk type of musician, but now he's just an extremely good lyricist and blues man. And he loved Henry as a character. He loved him on paper. He loved him even more when he saw The Rushes. And uh, he and Warren, who's a very, very accomplished musician, together we... We mapped out what we wanted in three days in the studio. We we did it, um, the and music's the music's very very haunting and melancholy. But it's also very restrained. There's no sentiment. There's no soppy, sickly sentiment about it, which you, neither Nick or I like. You went to the Ukraine, but is there undertones of that Russian uh, sure, feeling in, in what he wrote? Yeah, yeah, the music. yeah. Warren had listened to some Ukrainian Warren music. Warren who? Warren Ellis, his, his surname is, and. Um, he, and he'd listen uh, to the music? He, there is, there's a beautiful sense in which he slightly plays around with that. Um, there's a couple of instruments, I, I can't remember the names of them, but I think he, he imitated some of those sounds. Because if you use those in instruments, then that gives you that feeling that you say is melancholy, even yes. though you don't like it, but it gives you the tone yes. of what's going on. When you went to the Ukraine, did you have any restrictions put on you? No, surprisingly. I mean, it, it, it was a remarkable... Huh. sort of set of luck and circumstances. But Igor and Henry, who are the subjects of the film, they have a very good working relationship with the head of the KGB hospital. And 
bizarrely. Uh, he he <laughs> he trusts them, and once again, it's like that in the Ukraine. If you're if you're trusted by people, your family. So he let us in with three cameras. Um, and we didn't have any problem at all, really. You took three cameras into yeah, those Yeah, I was using one. I had two crews as well. It's a multi-camera shoot because that way you can shoot it like a drama. You're never short of great pictures. Oh, that's incredible. So it is a different approach to documentary filmmaking, so, yeah. isn't it? Very much so. I mean, it's all real. It all happened and they're very fast and we just have to run after them all the time. But if you think of it as a drama and cut it and shoot it accordingly, and play, I mean, you know, having a vision behind the reality. It's not just a document of what happened. It's a constructed moral fable. That's well, the point of the film. This form. film has been in a lot of festivals, and, it's, and it grabs you because of, I guess, the way you're talking about the way it's made, yeah. as a film, feature film, yes. rather than this talking head and that oh, talking absolutely. head. Oh, absolutely. There's one brief talking head, well, very brief. Tell, tell us the story. Really, overall, although it takes place in the Ukraine and it's a story of a surgeon <laughs> from England who goes there and has been going there for 15 years, the point of the film, the real meaning of the film, is one man struggle to do good things. And that's why it works with an audience, because his struggle is our struggle. He happens to inhabit a, a, a grand dramatic universe where he can save life but also take it away. But his choices and his morality and his motivation are all things that you and I can identify with. And he's really that kind of a man? You he's lived really with him. that <laughs> kind of a man. He is the real thing. He doesn't, he hasn't, he's been doing this selflessly and without self-promotion for 15 years. He hasn't required any money from anybody. He I spends a lot you. of his own money and time because he simply has a burning desire to help and a great friendship with Igor. Because, you know, you go to those different, you go to foreign countries, but someone's supporting you, someone's sending you, some group is raising money for you. Yeah, not in his case. Well, um, let me tell you the one thing that really got me is the opening scene when you see the drill and you see him working with wood, and I was looking at his hands going, why isn't he protecting his hands? <laughs> this is, like, so scary. I, w I was worried about the damage of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, other people have said that as well. His hand should be insured, really. You know? <laughs> that's right. Um, but he, he, he's his most relaxed when he's working with wood. Well, that's that's why said. we started the film that way. But the other thing that I thought was interesting is that he uses a drill. He uses those kind of, of uh, objects when he's operating. Totally. And the, the, the observant <laughs> viewer will note that the same circle he draws at the very front of the film on a piece of wood is the same circle he draws on the patient's head three quarters of the way Yeah, the film. Th that's what gets me. That's yeah. what got me because the first thing I was worried about is hands. Then I said, well, but that's the kind of instrument he uses. Of course. He loves power tools, he says. He's he does. always loved tools. He's got a whole <laughs> cabinet of chisels and things. You know, like. <laughs> and that's when he's comfortable. That's when he's most comfortable. Was he, does he do any of that kind of thing? Does he interact with the people in the Ukraine? Oh, as, as much as possible. He's, he's, he's terribly concerned, and that's why he, he, he looks a great deal older than he actually is. He, he, he's terribly concerned about people's welfare because neurosurgery, as he, as he describes it, is, is he's playing around with our thoughts and feelings. He yes, can destroy he you. Said, he yes. can take your personality away. Can, he can I turn know. you into someone that your family wouldn't recognize. I know. That's incredible. And that's incredibly scary stuff. It's huge moral responsibility to operate. Can yes. I save this person? If I do, am I going to destroy them in the process? Is that worth it? And there's all these dilemmas and balances. And Is he going to still be part of that family? Will they know him? Right. I mean, it's, it's yeah, really Yeah, you ask really those questions. Stuff. When you do a documentary, do you write everything out? Never. You don't? Never. So you don't have a storyboard? Never, because you, in my case, if it's an observed drama, it's happening in front of you, how on earth are you going to know what happened? I don't know whether the patient's going to live or die. Oh, that's true. Now, uh, Dr. Marsh is very interested in doing this. Does he, can he train someone else to go in and take his place? Yes, he, he, he's consistently training people. He brings a lot of Igor's younger doctors to England, and he, uh, he has a professorship here in Seattle. He's oh, training people from the States. He's extremely keen on imparting his, his, not only his technical wisdom, but moreover his sort of uh, the depth of decision making that's yeah. needed in neurosurgery. This is fantastic, the English surgeon, but let's just, like, in 40 seconds, 
tell me what your last uh, new documentary is. Well, this film's been consuming me for two years, even after it's been made, but I got the chance to co-direct something very strong and powerful in Mexico recently, so I was down there for three months. Uh, it's called Presumed Guilty. It's an amazing courtroom prison drama out of Mexico City. It's, it's in the Toronto Film Festival, and uh, it, it has a you can't make this stuff up, and the characters in this film you couldn't better from central casting. Well, I think, um, I'm so glad you came and talked to us today. You live in London now. You left Australia a long many time years ago. ago. Many years ago. But we're happy to have you with us. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks for watching. Come, uh, come back in a second with Haraj Tatizian. <laughs>I'm Joan Quinn and we're back with actor Haraj Tatizian, who was born and raised in Los Angeles. After attending three local Armenian schools, he graduated for, from Crescentia Valley High School. You've seen him on TV, in films, and on the stage. Haraj, they say you dropped out of college to act. Is that true? That is. That is true. Actually, I went to uh, Pasadena City College for about a year and a half before I dropped out so I can pursue acting. Well, what, what did your parents think about that? They weren't happy at all. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were not proud parents at the time. But uh, after a few months, I, I got into a play, and, and they saw me do a play, and they were really proud after that. So. so how did you prove that you could be an actress? I mean, here you are in Pasadena. Had you ever taken acting before? No, I took a small class at the college. Did you act in, in elementary school? Never. Never. Ne never until I was 19. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And then how did you know that you had it? You know, I, I always kind of knew, but I didn't know that I knew, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But when I was 19, I took that class in college. I, I fell in love with it, and, and I just started taking other classes and getting into plays. And so did you take, then you left college, and yeah. you went into acting classes, yeah. individual classes. So did did you have recommendations where to go? How'd you know yeah, where to go? Yeah, there was a few places I went and checked out. I was at the ended up at a place called the Beverly Hills Playhouse for a while. Oh, that they have a, a stage plays and yeah, they yeah, do they things. do their stuff too. They have the Skylight Theater and stuff. It's a good school. Oh, that was good. Yeah. And so, do you belong to an ensemble at that time, or you just take acting? No, I, I just I just did acting classes for a while, and then I started doing plays. I started auditioning for plays, and then after that, I started auditioning for television. So I got into TV. So did you think being in plays was easier than doing, than doing film? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's only easier because you have so much rehearsal, but everything uh, else about it is, is a lot harder uh, because you're performing in front of a live audience. And, you so know. you've been in a lot of films. Like you say, you started rehearsing, you've been in films. How, where did your first break come? My first break? You know, I, I don't know, it's hard to uh, identify what exactly a break is, but um, my first television show I, I, I got when I was 23 or 24, I think. Uh, and was that like a turning point? You were already on the stage though, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been on stage yeah for a while, but that was, yeah, in a way it was. I mean, it was only one line. Oh, but it was. Yeah, it was only one line. I was like, "Oh, cool! I'm on a TV show." But I had done like a lot of like independent films before that too. So. But but you you made a film with George Clooney. I did, yeah, no, yeah. I acted in a film uh, with George Clooney called "The Men Who Stare at Goats." And what was that story? It's very interesting, actually. It's an interesting, interesting film. I, I, um, it's about uh, George Clooney plays a guy who is a retired special forces guy who who um, specializes in special human powers. Superhuman powers. How do they? Oh, they have to develop them, or they develop those powers. Yeah, they 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 train in they this, train in, in this <laughs> thing. Yeah, and so basically, what it is is they can they can kill a goat simply by staring at it long enough. Oh, so that's the title. Yeah. And you were in the Kingdom. Yeah, I, I did a film called The Kingdom. That was actually my first studio film. It's called The Kingdom. And uh, my new old man. What's the story of that? It's with Ken Davidian? We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's just still, you know, we're, it's, we're still in the works. Um, yeah, it's my new old man we're doing together with Ken Davidian. And what's and the, the story of that? It's, a, it's about, he plays my father, and uh, it's, about, um, it's about a father and son relationship that has basically been a little, a little destroyed, and they, they bring it back towards the end of the film. You know, we talk about Ken Davidian, and we say... Um, of Borat fame, right? But he's been in film and TV, yeah. and TV and theater for years and years. Oh yeah, so he's been acting forever and a day. It took him, uh, 
maybe 30 years to be of Borat fame, right? right? Exactly. So people know who he is. He is in a new film, a, a DVD that's gone to DVD now called Float that oh, you're yeah. in. It's a float that I'm also in. He plays my father in Float as well. Oh, he does. Yeah, this he is does. a father son yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. huh? We actually did a little little play production too, where he played my father. So did you? We got some history with that. Oh, so what's the story of Float? Let's talk about that. Float a is bit. about relationships. You know, it's about um, a guy who works at an ice cream parlor, and um, the owner of that parlor, his wife leaves him, and so he comes and moves in with him. And the bachelors. It's a really cool story, and, and my character, who's the manager of the ice cream shop ends up falling in love with his daughter. and It's about friendship and love and relationships. It's, it's a really cool, sweet little story. Who wrote it? Um, a friend of mine named Johnny Asuncion wrote it, who, oh. who I met at uh, acting class. Um, I actually run an acting school called the Actors Play. I Pen. wanted to talk about that. Why did you start something like that? The Actors, what is it, Play? It's called the Actors Playpen. Playpen. I thought yeah. it was playpen, yeah. like for kids. Yeah. Playpen yeah, yeah, for yeah, kids. Yeah, exactly. It's a place where <laughs> actors can go and then they can play. You know, you've heard Playhouse, you've heard you know, um, the studios and, and this <laughs> right. and that, but I wanted to just make it sound funner. What did you, how, why did you start it and what is it? Well, I had been to a lot of classes, like I said, you know, like the Beverly's Beverly Playhouse and other places, and um, I just kind of wanted to do my own thing. You know, I, there was a lot of stuff I wasn't getting from the certain classes I was at, so I wanted to start my own place, so I, I gutted out this place, I built the theater. Oh, so it's a physical it's a place? It's a physical theater. Oh, yeah, it's a theater that we, we hold productions in. We do our own plays, oh, and, and we rent out for productions. We've had all sorts of things come in. Where is it? It's on Sunset and Gardner in Hollywood. Oh, so it's really local. Oh, yeah, Locally. it's local. It's a nice black box 50-seat theater, and we, we've been holding classes there for five years. And who teaches? Do you bring different um, people in? Yeah, I'm actually, I just started my Monday night class that I teach myself. I just started that, and uh, we have a Tuesday night class that has been there. For, for five years. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, do people send you scripts to the Playhouse, or play pen, um, yeah, play pen? I, 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 I do like to get, um, yeah, we, we get a lot of plays coming in that people want to do and they don't have the money for it. And unfortunately, um, I, I don't really produce plays unless my heart is really in it. It's a really big passion thing for me. Do you do readings? Uh, we do readings, yeah. We do readings of certain projects, see how they sound, you know. And then if, you're, if, if, if they do readings, do you direct? Do you ever direct? Uh, I, I'm not a director, no, I don't direct. So you never even wanted to direct? Mm, no, not really. I've directed scenes in class because students would come up to me and ask me like, hey, we, we need a director, we need a third uh -huh. eye for this, but it's, it's not really my, my cup of tea. Uh -huh. um, I do enjoy teaching, and in, within teaching you do have to direct a little bit, of course, but, uh, but acting is my passion. Do you write? I'm not a much of a writer. Oh, um, so that's, so you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, not I'm, I'm many an hyphenated person, yeah. you're acting. You did work on um, this fantastic play, Bengal Tiger and the Baghdad Zoo. Yeah, it Bengal was at Tiger. the Kirk D Douglas Theater, and it was directed, because since we're talking about directors, by Emmy and Tony Award winner, uh, or, yeah, nominated director, Moises Kaufman. Right. And how was it? Because he's had things on Broadway forever, oh, right? Oh, Moises is great, yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's great. He's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant director. How was it? How is he different from any of the other people you've... Uh, well, this was actually the biggest play I did. Was um, it? Yeah, Tell it us a little bit about it, because I love that play. Oh, uh, it's actually a funny story. I, I almost didn't go on the audition, because um, <laughs> I know, because they initially brought me in for a different role, and within that role, there was a lot of Arabic. And I, I, oh. I could pick up a little Arabic here and there, but I don't speak it fluently. But do you speak Armenian? I speak fluent Armenian, yes. I I read and write and speak, yeah. But, um, but Arabic, I was just overwhelmed by how much Arabic there was. So I said, you know what, they're just going to cast an Arab guy. I'm not going to go. Uh. So then I, I had made myself go. I said, you know, let's just go for the sake of the experience of the audition. So I did that. And then they brought me back in for a different character, Uday. Who Uday, Uday Hussein. Hussein. Yeah, yeah. Uday son. Hussein, the mean one. The mean one, yeah. <laughs> the, the man, yeah. He's, but, uh, but, you know, we, we've heard about Uday. We knew what he did and yeah. how how horrible the, the acts that he did and how, I don't know, self-righteous he was. Right. How did you research that? You know, I, there isn't much footage on him. I try to get as much footage as I can. I read articles on him. Articles, uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, documentaries. So I, I did what I can. Uh, I just watched him. I tried to watch his language and uh, his body movement and all that. This is uh, in the Armenian Reporter. I love this picture oh, of you. Thanks. There's a story about you in here. Um, and... You, you, you mentioned Ken Davidian, who works, is he at the playpen too? No, no, he, he's oh, been he there isn't. for rehearsals that we, we've done before, but no, he's not uh, 
part of that. And before we leave, is there a dream role that you would love to have? You know, that, that's a really good question. Uh, honestly, the Uday Hussein was as, as, as close as I could get <laughs> because um, it's always fun to play the bad guy. It's great. Yeah. And it was great that you were with us today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. And the DVD of Float just came out. Oh, yeah, DVD, yes. The Float. We've yeah, got to exactly. see that. It's, if you go on www.floatmovie.com, we'll you get can it. click on the Amazon symbol and and you can uh, get a DVD. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Keep writing to jaquinn1 at aol.com and 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.